Welcome everybody. I'm Bobby Wright with Becht Engineering. Uh, I help lead the um, the plant services practice here working with the guys and I want to introduce my co-presenter Dave DeWeese who leads the mechanical engineering uh, division here at Becht and we work very closely together on fixed equipment issues and many other issues. Today we're going to talk about a topic uh, a coke drum, coker, something that I've worked on a long time. One of my passions, both from a safety standpoint and a reliability standpoint. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is an is an occurrence that happened that I've seen maybe three or four times, not a lot in my my career, and it involves a, a one drum out of four actually uh, cracking around the skirt 360 degrees and falling inside. Uh, of the skirt itself and leaning at the same time. So that was quite a uh, quite an occurrence for the site. We got a call on Monday afternoon. Dave and I uh, went to the site the following day and we met with our site contacts and we began discussing the issue of what happened. Everybody there was, uh, you know, in, in the same uh, frame of mind of, uh, wow, something something significant happened. What happened? What to do about it? Next slide, please, Dave. So what we got when we, we got to the site, we met our, our team there, uh, our host and operators there on Tuesday morning. We went up to the structure. And what you see in the picture on the left um, is we're looking, this, this is a coker. Uh, we're looking at on the right is drum one. And on the left is drum two. And in the middle is the superstructure. And the white, the white areas that you see with the arrows, drum one uh, is basically vertical and, and the, the, the white, the see-through area, if you will, is pretty, uh, pretty symmetric. But on drum two, it's much larger, much wider. And you can notice that the drum two is leaning to the left in this case. So the illustration on the right just shows that, that, that is absolutely leaning, a uh, lot of weights, uh, four million pounds, full weight, uh, visible. There was also some rotation and people, uh, the site, the personnel was worried about the stability of the drum and the structure and, and really asked for our help in evaluating that uh, and then setting up a pen to, to go forward. Next slide, please, Dave. And again, that's what we were asked to do. What happened? Uh, it, it involved not only the site personnel, but our, our engineering staff working together to evaluate what was going on, maintenance, operation, process, inspection. And, and coming out of that uh, was the desire for a repair plan. Uh, back in those days, and unlike today, unfortunately, the margins were very good. So the goal for our project was to evaluate the drums, what happened, uh, make sure we understood what happened, that it was safe as it was, uh, and then to come up with a repair plan to get it back in its its appropriate position as soon as possible and fix it in the best manner uh, in terms of reliability and safety, then get it back up and running and the, the coker as, as soon as possible. So uh, our, our path forward, our, our marching orders basically, were to help them evaluate uh, the root cause, what caused the damage itself, and then come up with an action plan for correction and repair. As I said, to get the drum back in, uh, back in uh, drum drums back in operation. A little history on the drums themselves. Uh, the four drum coker. I had actually worked on these these same drums, the same coker in the early 2000s. Uh, when it came, they had some similar issues. Uh, unrelated to what happened today, but very similar. Coker is a fatigue machine, but these drums themselves uh, were installed in 2007, about 2,400 cycles, 30 feet in diameter. You guys and gals can all read this. Uh, 16 to 17 hour cycle, which many cokers change that from time to time. And then in the quench, uh, the initial rate of 200 GPM uh, is, is a, a critical data point for future reference, uh, as well as the, the, the temperature of the skirt switch to feet, which we'll go and Dave will go into more detail here in just a little bit. So what we're looking at, this is kind of what we 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 found when we got there. They were stripping insulation and you can see the cracking on the right, the 
the skirt to shell attachment where you see the red the uh, red arrow was cracked. The drum was visibly moved to one side, uh, fractured through wall. As you can see, it was a pretty impressive sight uh, to look at. I think uh, most of us were in awe, really. Uh, the other thing, once the, the site once th this happened to drum two, of course the sky, the site removed the insulation on the others, uh, other three drums in the coker and found a very similar cracking pattern, except that it was not through wall on the other drums uh, at that time. But nonetheless, it was quite a surprise, I think, um, uh, to the to the staff on site what what had happened. This is a top view looking down uh, on drum two and the red dots and the red areas actually show where the the top part of the skirt was sitting on the bottom part of the skirt, i.e. there was not a consistent uh, pressure or load uh, around the skirt. It was based at these points and that was uh, that was a little unique. I don't know that I'd ever seen that and as you can see with the photographs, uh, the the, the cracks were quite uh, quite large, um, quite open, and 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 again, uh, kind of scary to look at. And then from this, I think what Dave and I, uh, after we w went on site and, and looked at this, and, and then then we sat down with uh, with the site staff for most of the day. And we began making a plan and Dave's going to go into the details, the engineering details of what was actually looked for. But again, uh, we sat down with us with the staff there, maintenance and heavy lift and inspection and, and process and operation uh, to come up with this this action plan that uh, that Dave's going to talk about going forward. Dave. Thank you, Bobby, and hello, everyone. Um, Glad to have the opportunity to be here and, and talk about this project. And although our, our customers not able uh, to present this with us at the moment, um, they were amazing to work with. Uh, as Bobby said, this was kind of an awe-inspiring uh, thing and, and certainly one of the most impactful things uh, I've worked on. And uh, the, the first thing, you know, we, we've just kind of gone over the skirt conditions. Bobby showed you that. And I can tell you, walking around that skirt uh, early in December uh, started to become very concerned about what exactly was was holding uh, the drum up. And uh, you know, part of what we did was was certainly analysis, uh, and and this is uh, what we're looking at down at the bottom. You know, looking at those very local loads uh, where the the skirt and and the shell are in contact with one another. Uh, if you could have uh, collapse, uh, you know, local buckling. Uh, and so that was certainly one of the first things we did. But uh, one of the immediate insights that the site had that I, I thought was uh, really impactful because uh, there's analysis and then there's reality, and hopefully they agree. But uh, in this case, uh, without any analysis, because this happened when the drum was full and 4 million pounds and it hadn't collapsed, and now it was empty by the time we got there, 850,000 pounds, uh, the empty weight, you can immediately say that just on dead weight, uh, on that buckling collapse of the skirt, you had a factor of 4.7. So that was one of the first things, you know, you want to establish that this is safe uh, to be around. And, and that was the first step. And we were able to match analysis to that. Uh, and the reason that's important is it's not just dead weight. Obviously, we want to look at wind um, as well. So we're able to use that same uh, analysis and look at what wind speed would be needed uh, to make this unsafe, uh, given the condition it's in. And thankfully, we ended up with 140 mile per hour wind with some very conservative assumptions. Uh, and, and that allowed us to go forward uh, that this was not an immediate safety risk uh, to the people uh, around, uh, including us, which which is obviously the place you have to start. So once you get past that, we, we can immediately start talking about remediation. And uh, there's multiple ways you, you can look at remediation. 
Uh, certainly a crane would be one option, but for various reasons that that was not pursued here. What was pursued was a lift uh, from the skirt level deck. And so we were able uh, to, to work with the site and with the lift contractor uh, to design uh, that lift, certainly from the vessel side. And you're seeing a, a solid model that we did as part of the drawing package to look at how you go about doing that. We ended up with 16 lugs uh, sized for uh, this lift for AISC and collapse analysis as well, which is what the FEA is showing you there. And, and the important thing is uh, sizing it for, for what might happen as well. So this is a lot of lugs. Uh, they're very beefy. We, we sized uh, you know, pads to make sure the shell would have the integrity it needs. And that's really driven by an impact factor, uh, which you know, we have quite a bit of experience with. We have a, a very experienced heavy lift group. But what that really gets at is uh, shifting weight. You know, this is, uh, in some ways, not 100% stable as you're trying to lift it because uh, you know, it's bound up inside the skirt. What if it suddenly gives and weight shifts? Um, you have to account for those things. So thankfully, uh, we had some knowledge about an impact factor and, and we're able to build that into uh, the analysis. We really threw the book at this in working with the site. Um, safety was the number one goal. So tolerances um, to the point where we looked at allowable offsets. What if uh, the jack isn't quite centered? You know, what is the impact of that? Um, so really quite a bit of work went into that, uh, qualifying the concrete deck for the loads. And then even so far as looking at fracture mechanics. So as Bobby mentioned, it's a coke drum, it's a fatigue machine. Uh, there's obviously cracks uh, in the skirt, but it's very likely that there are cracks uh, on the inside of the, the drum itself as well. And one of those could be uh, in a region of high stress induced by the lift. So we actually use the finite element analysis to qualify maximum flaw sizes that would be acceptable uh, under the lift conditions uh, to make sure there weren't uh, any fracture concerns as well. So with, with that work done, uh, really all the focus was on the lift. And uh, this lift plan here shown at the bottom or an image from the lift plan uh, is from the, the lift contractor, Mahmoud, uh, who actually executed this uh, day or two after after Christmas in 2018 uh, without a hitch. But uh, you can see uh, there are eight jacks and jack stands with a very heavy beam uh, that runs to two of the lugs. So uh, that's what that's what we're showing in the, the figure or the, the image to the left and to the right. What you see is that actual implementation of that. Uh, up at the top, you can see the lug with the, the welded pad, the very heavy beam, uh, and the jack stand. So uh, the whole point of that is to get this thing back up into about the right position so that we can finally move on to repair. And uh, thankfully, right about three weeks, just a little bit less, I think, uh, from the drum initially dropping inside the skirt, that was accomplished. Uh, you can see here too, and I'm going to show you more on the next slide. Uh, this picture was actually taken uh, after the lift was performed, uh, which makes sense, uh, and actually after the damaged material had been gouged out. So you can already see the beginning of the new weld prep. The repair is one of the most impressive things uh, I've ever seen. It was uh, an amazing display of organization uh, and, and skill. Uh, really under uh, tremendous pressure uh, happening at the holidays. Uh, certainly the site worked long, long hours. Um, we were working long hours too to support them, um, but the end result was amazing. So uh, once they got the, the drum lifted back into its approximate position, not bearing on the skirt, but just held right in place, uh, they were able to pull using key plates, which are shown up at the top right, uh, the drum, most of the drum, back into tight alignment uh, so that we could uh, actually, or so that it could be actually welded on. 
Uh, a few of the regions were, were too buckled, too damaged. Uh, and if you think back to the, the photos that, that Bobby showed you of the, the waviness and the skirt uh, and drum as it kind of crossed over itself. So some of those pieces were, were cut out and replaced. But in the end, you had a, a very nice skirt um, fit up uh, as, as we're looking at up in the upper right. And then if you look right below it, uh, the weld has been executed. And, and the amazing thing is this was completed uh, around the clock for a few weeks, three shifts nonstop, and there were zero defects found uh, using phase to race. So just an uh, amazing accomplishment in my mind. So that ends the exciting and, and stressful part of the story. Uh, and it was, it was definitely an exciting and, and stressful uh, holiday season. Um, but, but the next focus was really on root cause. Um, you know, there's some, some high level things we can point to right away and say this was a very stiff skirt, so it's not all that surprising. Um, and as Bobby mentioned, there was some very similar skirt damage back in the early 2000s. So in some ways, history repeated itself a little bit. Uh, so in terms of root cause, we're not talking about a high level root cause, so to speak. Uh, we're talking about exactly why did it happen so that we can really look at fixing it with a high, high degree of confidence uh, and, and track damage and life uh, as we go along. So the second part of the presentation is going to be a pretty big shift. Um, we're really going to focus on the data analysis, which is one of the things that really motivated us uh, to, to share uh, all this in particular because there was a health monitoring system after what happened in the early 2000s on these newer drums, uh, we had a vast amount of data uh, to work with. And, and we actually developed software about this time to be able to read in vast amounts of, of health monitoring system or HMS data and to, to process those results into cycles, which is what we're showing here overlaid uh, in both cases, a year's worth of uh, cycle data laid over top of one another. But once we have that uh, cycle data, those cycles isolated, to, to really look at statistics and, and try to understand what critical factors uh, correlated with the damage. So uh, that was also a, a big part of this and, and something we're going to try and focus on. So when we're looking at a skirt, uh, it probably won't come as a surprise that one of the biggest indicators of, of damage uh, and, and of stress is the temperature difference between the top of the skirt or the skirt uh, and the drum uh, at that point where it's attaching. So uh, the skirt is not in contact with what's happening inside. It's always going to lag. So when the drum's getting hot and pushing outward, uh, the, the skirt itself doesn't want to. It's going to resist. And likewise, after it's uh, had time to get hot uh, during the coking cycle itself or part of the cycle, uh, it, it's going to resist uh, the quench behavior where the drum is getting cold and wants to pull in and, and the hot skirt uh, doesn't want to. So one of the first things we did as part of this data analysis was say, uh, what is the behavior uh, in terms of temperature and temperature difference? around the skirt and the junction region. So here we're plotting skirt to shell temperature difference uh, at four locations, 90 degrees apart around that skirt. This is from the health monitoring system. And we're showing it chronological for uh, 2018, actually almost all of 2018. And the interesting thing that jumped out uh, right away was that it wasn't the same location um, uh, at all that was seeing the maximum temperature difference that was moving around uh, the drum. Uh, now, this is a combined temperature difference. It's the temperature difference at uh, switch, switch to feed, plus the temperature difference, um, or minus, depending on how you look at it, uh, during quench. Uh, so it's, it's meant to correspond to sort of a stress range uh, for fatigue uh, that you think about. But what was interesting was it was jumping around uh, to different spots on a cycle to cycle basis, and it was only one location uh, for any given cycle that was very bad. Uh, so at a time like right after cycle 75, for instance, 
you see the BTCs, uh, the overall temperature difference is 525 degrees almost. Um, at that same time, the other temperature differences around the skirt were much less than half. And when we totaled all of those up and, and looked at the average range of delta T at those four different clock locations, what we found was, uh, reasonably speaking, uh, it was about an equal distribution at each one of those occurrences uh, or equal distribution of occurrences at each one of those locations and about equal um, uh, range of delta T, which is an indicator of stress and damage. And, and what that means is we can look at one location and what's happening at it and say, that's representative of what's happening at all the other locations. And we can really use kind of a, a simpler two-dimensional idealization uh, to calculate fatigue and damage on a cycle by cycle basis, which is really the goal here and, and what we did. Before we can do that, uh, we, we have to use that health monitoring system data again to calibrate uh, our model, our finite element model, because it's simply uh, too complex what's happening uh, inside a Coke drum to, to random, so to speak, to predict that first principles, or at least to practically predict it first principles. So here we're tuning heat transfer coefficients, things like that within physically reasonable bounds to get a very close match to detailed cycle behavior. And what we did was we picked uh, the minimum, maximum, and average switch temperature uh, cycles that gave those uh, um, results and calibrated uh, our model to three cycles that gave uh, min, max, and average switch temperature behavior. So moving on to what those results look like, uh, this is the minimum switch, so the, the worst case uh, cycle by far. And uh, I think people are, are familiar with this. We're looking at the fill along the top row and it's temperature on the left. And you can see that hot drum, red and orange is pushing out and the skirt is still cold. It doesn't want to, so it's being bent outwards. Uh, in terms of stress, our critical location this will show up is right here. Here's where a crack initiated, uh, and that is uh, in compression, and it's uh, approximately twice yield, twice the yield strength of the material in compression, just on one part of the cycle. It's tension on the outside. On the other hand, when we move to the quench part of the cycle, uh, the colder blue here of the cone and drum is trying to pull inwards, and it's being resisted by the hot skirt, which still wants to be expanding outwards. We flipped the stress, we were blue compression, now we're red tension, and again, we are more than twice yield uh, just on that part of the uh, cycle itself. So what we were able to do was take those results, uh, the finite element results, and plot them, the, the maximum stress or the plastic strain, that we were getting for each one of those cycles, min switch temperature, average switch, and uh, max switch temperature, and plot the predicted stresses that were calibrated to the thermocouples uh, versus the temperature difference that was measured between the skirt and shell. And it gave us a really, really strong correlation uh, between temperature difference, measured temperature difference between the skirt and shell and stress and strain. And so we're able to feed that into a cycle by cycle analysis. Uh, that is, if we know what the uh, skirt to shell temperature difference is, we use our function uh, to look up stress or strain and calculate fatigue damage. Um, and that's shown here for one location um, for one full year, 2018. And as you see in red, that is the cycle by cycle predicted damage accumulation based on delta T and we end up with 11%. So that's 228 cycles. Uh, we would be at 11%. There's only 210 shown here, uh, but it is 228 for a full year. And if you know that you end up with 11% damage after one year, and that this is repeatable, because we were able to look at 2010, 2016, and 2018 data, and it was uh, quite repeatable in a statistical sense, then we can ask uh, if it takes us one year to get 11%, how many years to get to 100? 
and that's nine years. So that is for crack initiation. So that's for the fatigue curve telling us that we uh, are at 100% damage, which represents the formation of a small crack. And the next thing we did was use these same stresses and this distribution of stress to look at how long it would take uh, a small crack to grow through the one inch thick skirt under these conditions and using average crack growth properties, not minimum, like you would find uh, in API 579, but average, we ended up with 1.4 years, which made us feel uh, like we were doing a good job in, in calibrating and predicting uh, the actual failure. Uh, and again, this is highly calibrated. This couldn't be done by first principles uh, or without health monitoring system data. Uh, but the, the end result is that using uh, tools that you know are readily available um, and using material data, nothing, nothing exotic, things you can find in the open literature, and combining that with the health monitoring system data, we're able to predict 10.4 years to failure through wall versus 10 to 11 years for actual because we're not actually sure when the cracks went through wall. They could have been there for a little bit of time uh, before the, the uh, drum actually dropped inside the skirt. So uh, in the end, we were, we were very confident uh, that we had actually a very reasonable solution. Yeah, I mentioned the focus here is on, on sharing data uh, and on, on sharing some of the, the insights we, we obtain by really studying that data. And one of the things I wanted to highlight that, you know, we, we typically think, and, and certainly I typically thought that uh, for the skirt uh, region, the skirt junction, switch to feed and, and fill would be the most critical part of the cycle. And, and certainly it is an important part of the cycle. Um, we saw that in the stress analysis uh, slides a few a few slides back. Uh, you know, it caused stresses of approximately twice yield itself. But what was surprising was the magnitude of the skirt to shell temperature difference um, during quench as well. And it, this applied to all the different locations. Uh, it was consistently higher um, and and certainly much much more variable from cycle to cycle uh, than than the fill. So. I thought that was uh, interesting and worth sharing. And as we know, uh, particularly since the bad spot in the drum is moving around um, from cycle to cycle, not unlike uh, the behavior we see higher in the drum when we think of channeling and uh, some of the randomness associated with that, not every cycle caused a lot of damage at a given location. We kind of broke it up into buckets where uh, 100 to 250F was very, very small damage, essentially negligible. Uh, 250F to 400F, uh, you're getting more substantial, but you're not really even past yield. So uh, quite a bit of fatigue life there. But once you get to 400 to 550F temperature difference, uh, and that's combined uh, both on the uh, fill part of the cycle and the quench, you're doing a lot of damage. And there were 31 cycles there uh, and those really did the vast majority of the crack initiation work, it appears, uh, in this case. Uh, along the lines of, of sharing data, um, you know, one of the things we, we found useful, and, and again here the, the focus was on finding a, a critical factor that we could correlate to damage so that we have a, a simple way to track uh, damage. We don't want to do uh, finite element analysis to the extent we did it uh, on every cycle going forward to try and predict damage that wouldn't be useful. Um, but in, in looking to find uh, a really uh, solid critical factor that correlated to damage, certainly skirt to shell temperature difference did. And you can go a step further. We've just been presenting those overall values. Uh, so this difference minus this difference, let's say, because it's negative to get overall 150 to 325, so our 475 uh, difference. So this is one of the, the bad cycles we talked about, one of those 31 cycles on the last slide. If you uh, go a step further than just looking at those peaks and tracking them, but looking at the history uh, or the, the behavior throughout the history of a given cycle, what jumps out when you plot it against the quench flow rate is that uh, all of that temperature difference is happening 
uh, during that that hour when you start quench, even though that quench is at by far the lowest rate, um, the lowest flow rate of the cycle, that's when all of the temperature difference and all of the damage in this case was happening, which means that's our critical uh, our critical thing to focus on in terms of uh, improving uh, the stresses from an operational standpoint. And you can see even as we're ramping up dramatically in the flow rate, we're actually decreasing dramatically our temperature difference. So uh, quench rate uh, here, I thought this was a good opportunity to illustrate uh, the critical importance, even for a skirt, uh, when that's not always uh, what we think about uh, quench rate importance in terms of skirt reliability. So with that, I want to turn it back over uh, to Bobby uh, to wrap things up for us. Thank you, Dave. Uh, excellent uh, overview uh, into the details of why this happens, because that's where it all starts, understanding why this happens. Um, for this specific site, there were some other extenuating circumstances. They were bound by a skirt design, uh, a short skirt design uh, that was not optimal for, for operation in this case. Um, the, the couple of things that I really want to hit on here, um, a coker is a fatigue machine, it's batch operated, it's going to crack, it's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when. And the, the, the good news is though that with, with installation of health monitoring, as, as Dave it showed, going back really to the early to mid 2000s, looking at all of this temperature and these temperature gradients and then overlaying it with the process variables. Um, it, it's really how you have to operate the drum that causes or accelerates the damage as Dave illustrated. Uh, one thing that he highlighted there was the initial quench water rate, which is cre creeped up and we've we've looked at about 50 drums over the last 18 months, two years. And the quench rate, the lower the quench rate is generally 75, 100 gallons a minute, uh, that range, uh, it, it's much easier on the drums and, and that Delta T that, that Dave described. Uh, sometimes you have to do more, but you at least will see the impact of doing that when you have a, a health monitoring system installed. You can track the damage. You don't have to look at it every day, but maybe every quarter. Uh, and in this case, this operator had the ability to do that, and many operators do. So that's something I we would certainly recommend is take the take the time to look at what the data is telling you because on a coker and a coke drum, you can predict what's happening or what's going to happen, and you can you can get a pretty good idea of about when when you need to inspect where you need to inspect. Um, and then one step farther is when it gets really bad, when do you need to plan plan on repairs and replacement? Um, I think we all know that that if if we wait until we have an incident like this or an occurrence like this, uh, from a maintenance and repair standpoint, it can cost you three to four times or more to do it in an emergency situation versus get out ahead of it. So that's one of the things holistically, you know, from this, we know what caused it. We, we could go back and look at the data and see that uh, right now budgets are tight. Uh, you know, we don't want to spend any more money than we have to, but some, you know, some good and focused inspection in areas and areas and some good adherence to a, a best practice for switching quench procedures um, is, is important and something that you want to get a handle on. And then just take a look after with your, you know, your site personnel. So um, I think going forward, that's, that's what this site uh, is doing uh, is, you know, and, and really trying to help management. We want to help management understand um, that in, in some cases money has to be spent and this is a coker is one of those. So in ending, I, I just really want to, I want to thank Dave. I want to thank our team for all the work, all the hours. And then obviously I want to thank the operators, uh, the folks we worked with at this Gulf Coast site uh, for calling uh, for trusting us and then really working side by side with us over a three to four week period. I think the uh, I think you know the some of the final data data analysis went longer than that, but uh, working 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week um, is, is what it takes sometimes. And and again, I just want to thank everybody involved in this and the the operators, the folks we work with, will be involved in the Q and A session. 
uh, that that's coming up uh, for this this uh, uh, discussion. Dave, any anything else you want to add? No, no, uh, just that it was uh, something I'll, I'll never forget. And, and certainly the people you work with under conditions like that, you remember forever. So it was uh, it was awe inspiring. But uh, again, amen. Yeah. amen to that. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you. And uh, I just will add, uh, you know, let's just keep our chins up. It's kind of tough right there out there, but we can still do things that make a difference. Thank you and God bless.